to welcome to our meditation together. And, and as a introduction to the sitting, I would like to make a distinction between being responsible and being responsive. As soon as we have ideas of I'm responsible, of responsibility, it tends to come along with a sometimes a very strong sense of self. Oneself is the agent, the oneself who has obligations, oneself that has to figure it out and that has to do it. And with that then comes a whole slew of other baggage around self and being good enough, doing better, proving oneself, not being good enough, um, making some kind of uh, uh, very personal, emphasize effort and success and all kinds of things. If instead of thinking about ourselves as being responsible for what's happening, the direction that we go in, in doing mindfulness practice, the opportunity in mindfulness is to touch into a capacity we have that's very different than how we often operate in everyday life. It's kind of like the, the rules of the game are different in med- meditation than they are as we go about our life and work and whatever we're doing. In everyday life, responsible seems to be in some societies a very key part of how people think. But in meditation, we don't need to do that so much. We're responsible to get ourselves to sit and meditate. But once we're here, then the uh, focus shifts and changes to being responsive to what arises. In other words, whatever arises, whatever occurs, we're not responsible for. And why it arose, where it came from, what we did before that made it happen is really besides the point. If something is happening, it's happening. If something's occurring, it's occurring because of causes and conditions, and we don't have to be concerned about why it's come up. The main thing we want to do is to be responsive to what we do next. Responsive to how we are with it. And here's where it gets even more interesting in mindfulness, is that there's many responses the responses of mindfulness is very respectful, very generous, very spacious. It's to open the hand of the mind, of awareness, and respond to whatever arises in meditation with awareness, with recognition. Oh, that's what's happening. That's how it is. Oh, I see. Let's make room for it in awareness. This is okay. It's okay. It's okay in the context of being aware. In the context of meditation, we're beginning to shift the locus of where we abide to be abiding in that place, in that mindset where we can be responsible to a whole mindset where we're being attentive instead. Living, abiding in awareness that's responsive to experience rather than responsible. Responsive for meditation, just the open awareness, clear awareness, recognition. So to take a meditative posture, a posture perhaps that is maybe a little bit of a dignified posture a posture as if you are rooted in your location and that your whole being rises up or exists in this location with a certain clarity of being, a clarity of being here, with a certain dignity or a certain strength 
as if you deserve to be here, as if this is your place, as if you can be, feel like a valued being here, upright, clear, not proud, not conceited, not humble, not withdrawn, here. And then within this here, at the center of it all, to take a few long, slow, deep breaths. Breathing in deeply and feeling the stretching and expanding of the torso, rib cage, lifting of the shoulders. Maybe the expanding of the belly. And then as you exhale, gentle, long exhale, relax, settle in. Allow the pull of gravity to ground you in this body as you exhale. And then letting your breathing return to normal. And to Allow the experience of breathing <clears throat> to come into awareness. Allowing the experience of breathing to reveal itself to your body. So it's your body that experiences breathing. The movements of the body felt in the body. Experience of pressure and tautness and the release of pressure in the body. And maybe as you exhale to relax the thinking muscle, the mind that maybe was often overworked, maybe even tired if you feel it carefully. And letting the mind relax, soften, And it might even even help in being aware in a relaxed, receptive way to relax the mindfulness muscle. Maybe there's a kind of way in which you try too hard to be mindful. Perhaps settling back, relaxing in the mind, partly because a calm, relaxed mind will be aware. It's a natural part of the mind. Quieting your thinking. Letting go of your thoughts and letting go into the experience of breathing.
and then whatever occurs while you're meditating. See if you can switch from any tendency to be responsible or to take the blame or attribute it to somehow to yourself as the cause. Shifting from being responsible to being responsive and responding with a very simple movement of the mind. Responsive by allowing it to exist in awareness, to simply be aware. To be aware and in so see it more clearly Experience it a little bit more clearly without being for or against the experience. Responding by opening the fist of the mind, the fist of the heart. So whatever occurs is held in the soft palm of awareness.
symptom of being responsible is contracting the body, holding the body tense. An expression of being responsive is to hold that tension in awareness, caringly, and then allowing for the relaxation of the body.
So as we come to the end of this sitting, There's a long tradition in Buddhism of dedicating the merit of any practice activity we do. Dedicating the merit for others, maybe to all beings. And to give this dedication of merit specificity so that it really is something that we can do and act on and and benefit from, be changed by. It's good to be, to think practically about what we can do to benefit others. So it's not just wishful thinking. And how is it caring for other beings? What is the opportunity of what can motivate you to care for others. If you come from a place of being responsive rather than responsible, might there be some place deeper inside where the depth of caring, the depth of being moved, the depth of being motivated that maybe is deeper than self, ideas of identity or who we are or what we have to do. And may it be that as you go by through your day today, that you take the time to touch into that deeper place within that can be responsive. And let there be care in your speech, in your actions, and in your mind that cares for the welfare and well-being of others. On this day, may you reach out to someone who is alone, lives alone in a time of shelter, someone who is sick or struggling with the economics, or who's afraid, or who is hungry. May the depth of your care coming out of your meditation, be a force of good in this world. For this second talk on the second noble truth, the truth of the arising of suffering, I'm going to talk about a variation of what I talked about yesterday, uh, that the second noble truth is the cause of suffering. That's a common interpretation. A A variation of that is that rather than looking for a cause, the second noble truth is pointing to the conditions, the conditionality of suffering. And that what we want to discover in this, what's being pointed to is um, uh, the conditions for the arising of suffering. Now, there's a strong tendency in the teachings of the Buddha to avoid what could be called causal language. Causal in the sense of a deterministic cause, or or a a something that uh, when it happens, uh, when X happens, Y will happen. Because if there's if it's deterministic that way, then there's no movement for practice. We will experience what happened in the past, 
And then there's no point to practice or do anything different because the continuity of past causes, it was just something we have to experience. Uh, and this the Buddha was quite explicit about. Uh, the other thing he was uh, very reluctant, to, reason he was reluctant to talk about cause, seems to be that causal language lends itself to the idea that there's someone who is the cause, an agent of the cause. And so uh, rather than talking about anything that suggests an agent, over and over again, the Buddha chooses language or descriptions of reality that talk about how conditions come together. And it's the conditionality, the conditions, the flow, the process of conditionality that, um, that gives birth to the world that we experience. And in this regard, the second noble truth is looking not at the deterministic cause, but rather the condition that needs to be there, the necessary condition that uh, for suffering to be there. The, um, if the necessary condition is present, it doesn't have to lead to suffering. But if there is suffering, that necessary condition is in place. So this is getting now into a little bit more complicated, maybe philosophical ideas, but it has something to do also with how the process of looking at our lives changes as we start doing meditation practice. In ordinary life, it's completely natural to look at cause, and the causes maybe are looked at over time. That um, if I was angry with my friend yesterday, and now my friend doesn't want to see me, I suffer. The cause of that suffering is what happened yesterday. That's the ordinary way of seeing. But that's a more complicated analysis involving p past and present and future. The, uh, uh, when we're looking at a meditative experience, we're focusing on what's the conditionality in the present moment. What's, the, what's happening in the present? So that in the present, something about the present moment experience, we can discover awakening, real freedom. And not to have to analyze, consider what, else, what was I doing yesterday, and looking, analyzing, figuring out what was the cause of that. In meditation, we're looking at the moment-to-moment -moment experience as it arises. And one of the remarkable things about quiet, deep, mindfulness meditation is we can ar watch things arise without it rising with any reference to self. I didn't plan that thought, I didn't uh, will that thought. It's almost as if, of course, a particular thought is happening to me, within me, but the agent, me as the agent, doesn't seem to be operating. It's just a thought. A thought arises and we don't identify it, that's me. Um, and so you can watch something arise without identifying, and it's possible to see how with the arising of one thing, something else arises, not as a necessary uh, result, but in relationship to the first one, in, with the first one as a condition. So if I have a thought about, uh, you know, if I have a thought about uh, what happened in high school, um, high school girlfriend, for example, then um, the next thing, uh, that's just a thought. I could come and go, I might have those thoughts periodically over my adult life, and there's no charge to it. But it might be that I get angry. The anger is not necessary to follow the, the thought about the girlfriend, but um, without the thought about the girlfriend, that anger about what happened doesn't occur. And so we start, see, but it's possible to have both of those arise in a certain kind of way that we just see them in the, in the clarity of awareness where in that clarity, we're not involved in them, picking at them, reacting to them. They just seem to float up, appear, and then the next one appears based on the first one. And there starts to be a kind of freedom in relationship to it, freedom from reactivity. So in the meditative mind, rather than looking for cause, we're looking for conditionality. Conditions also allow us to see a bigger picture than cause. Often when we look at cause, we're identifying a single cause. And uh, that's the cause. 
but the, 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 there can be a range of conditions that add up to our suffering. And um, so uh, an example might be that um, I'm driving down the freeway every day to work and I see a billboard for some wonderful product for sale and I salivate and just really want that. It's hard to not get off the freeway to go buy it. Every day I feel this tremendous desire to buy that thing. And I suffer because of it. I get to work frustrated and anxious and I hardly keep my attention at work because I'm thinking about this thing that I want to get. And so, and then I can't, oh, don't have money to buy it and then I'm frustrated with myself or, all, you know, it goes on and on the story. So, the cause of all that is maybe my desire, my desire for this thing. But I can't give up the desire. It's very stuck and, and strong. So, but if I look at the conditions, one of the conditions for that strong desire and obsession is seeing that billboard. So then I decide, let's just go on a different freeway, different road, not see the billboard. And lo and behold, I don't get triggered in the usual way. So, silly example, but um, it's an sh- example of how when we start looking at conditions, we can see much more of the situation and more where we can intervene. And one of the ways we intervene in the world of conditionality is we allow something just to be. Craving arise, strong desire arises, and we see it, and we know it's a condition for further clinging and you know, grasping and all kinds of other things. But in the meditative mind, we just see it as a single event of craving and we let it be. And that's described as cutting right, cutting the chain of conditionality at the point of craving. They also say that one of the conditions for craving is that we see something or experience something pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant or unpleasant. There's a direct experience of something. And sometimes it's possible to just see the pleasantness of experience. And then maybe we see the desire arise, but because it's so clear how one exists and the following, next one follows, we can, we can, in a sense, allow them to just be separate and not have them linked together to form strength. We just, they say that the chain of conditionality the sequence of conditions are, is cut between feelings and desire, and thereby finding some freedom. So uh, uh, the Buddha talked a lot about conditionality. Um, uh, this is one of the ways that uh, conditionality hasn't been under uh, the second noble truth has been understood, and um, and it can be quite helpful to see it this way. And uh, as I said, now it's part of the meditative, it really comes to fruit or is really seen clearly in the meditative mind. And what we'll see uh, in the next talk tomorrow is uh, uh, how further the meditative mind going deeper into concentration lends itself to the next interpretation, probably the most common interpretation of the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha had. So I want to thank you, and uh, I look forward to our next time together.